Yeah, I'm excited just to give you um, an overview of the Dawn project. And it's really research that is happening in, uh, in all four of our groups. So it's kind of an, an overview of a lot of work in this area. So the, the focus on Dawn um, is, uh, is basically infrastructure for usable machine learning. How can we make machine learning dramatically easier to use in production? Uh, so I think everyone kind of knows or has a sense that it's the golden age of data. There are uh, incredible advances in machine learning powered by large-scale data in fields like image recognition, natural language processing, uh, planning, and so on. And these things are starting to have, you know, not just uh, demos here and there, but society-scale impacts through things like autonomous vehicles or personalized medicine. And there's no end in sight for these advances. This story sounds great, but there's actually a little bit of of a, uh, of a footnote or a caveat, which is it is the golden age of data, but only for the best funded and best trained engineering teams. Um, all of the major successes in machine learning so far, the ones that actually managed to have society scale impact, have required teams of hundreds to thousands of engineers working on technology like Siri or AlphaGo or self-driving cars. And then the really interesting thing is if you look at what those engineers and all the other individuals involved in these efforts are doing, most of them are not actually doing machine learning. It's not like there are thousands of people you know, clustered around a whiteboard at Apple building Siri and like writing up uh, you know, equations and, uh, and statistical models. Actually, most of the effort to build uh, a, a real application powered by machine learning tends to be in things like data acquisition, like how do we actually scan you know, all the data sources that we'll put into Siri so that it knows you know, what restaurants are near you and what movies are playing and so on. Uh, data preparation, cleaning, uh, fixing up the input data testing and productionizing a model. How do you make sure you know, this isn't just a demo that works once, but something that works reliably that you can make guarantees about uh, and that you can actually use to power you know, your, uh, your business? Uh, so a lot of the work is not just in core machine learning, and there's a lot of um, uh, manual kind of effort and work involved in building these applications. So we're not the first ones to talk about this issue. Actually, uh, this here is a, is a paper from Google uh, called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems, where they talk about where the effort actually goes in a production machine learning application. And they've built a bunch of these, uh, so they have some sense of it. And if you look at this picture, there are all these boxes here for the things they have to do, like collect data, extract features, you know, manage the data, serve it, uh, and so on, uh, analyze how well it's actually doing. And then there's this small black box in here, uh, which is the machine learning code. So you can see most of the uh, work is not in the machine learning code. It's actually in getting the pipeline to power uh, that algorithm and reliably make it uh, you know, actually run on, uh, on, on real world data. So in the Dawn uh, project, we're trying to ask this sort of uh, bold question, which is what if anyone with just domain expertise in a particular area could build their own production quality machine learning product? So without needing a PhD in machine learning, which is that little black box in there, but also without being an expert in systems and large scale data management and in the latest hardware to actually serve that model. And it might seem like a, you know, a big step to go from thousands of engineers building one of these applications to just one or two domain experts. But the thing we want to point out that gives us some hope is that this kind of shift has happened before in other areas of uh, computing. Uh, so one example of this, kind of my favorite example, is search. If you look at search, there have been decades of academic research on search. There are still many conferences, large conferences on information retrieval, and lots of ideas in terms of indexes, ranking structures, how to actually serve search efficiently, and so on. Uh, and search is kind of like machine learning in that you know, the, the result is in some ways subjective. A human has to look at it. It's not just a kind of well-defined deterministic result. But today, uh, pretty much any software developer can add search to an application really easily uh, using just a library. So people have figured out how to package these into libraries like Solar. And furthermore, any computer user knows how to use search, and so you see it in, in every application out there. So we think the same can be true of uh, many forms of machine learning. And the thing that we 
learn from search is that the, the key idea that's enabled us to you know, allow everyone to add search to their application is to build an end-to-end -end system, which is these search libraries, that tackle the barriers to access and to production use. So when you set up one of these in your application, you don't need to know those decades of research. Uh, it works pretty well. It also has pretty good monitoring and tuning knobs, and you know, kind of any developer is able to get search working sort of correctly. So in Dawn, we're actually building a, a kind of a stack of software systems to, a, to attempt to do this for machine learning. And we're focusing on several different applications as well as some cost-cutting concerns, like say making this work efficiently on, uh, on the latest hardware so you can actually put this thing in a, in a mobile phone or like whatever, uh, wherever you need to deploy your application. And I'm just going to give a, a short overview of three of the projects to give you a sense. And there's a lot more on our website about what we're building. So first example, to give you a sense of what, what we mean by an end-to-end -end machine learning system, I'll talk about Macrobase. This is actually Peter Bayless's project for streaming data. Um, so Macrobase is an end-to-end system to, uh, to identify, detect, and identify anomalies in data streams. And the interface to it is, is actually really simple. So basically, you put in streams of data with many attributes. For example, imagine you've deployed, uh, you know, uh, say, a mobile application or maybe a sensor in people's homes or something. The attributes could be things like, uh, where is it located geographically? What's the temperature? What model of the sensor is it? You know, what version of the software and so on. And Macrobase looks at this and it gives you anomalies. For example, it might say version seven of the software uh, in uh, you know, envi environments that are very warm uh, is running out of battery very quickly or something like that. So that's what it's supposed to do. And obviously it's a useful thing for monitoring pretty much any kind of application uh, you might deploy. Uh, now, the inputs to Macrobase look something like this. So you've got these streams of data with many attributes. These are actually uh, from a mobile application. And there's too much data to inspect it manually and find these anomalies. Actually, we found that uh, most people, uh, e even people who collect such logs, only look at about 6% of the data ever. And they only look when something goes terribly wrong and someone has to inspect it. Um, what Macrobase does instead is you just tell it which attribute you're interested in, like say battery drain, and it automatically produces reports like this. It finds the groups of attributes that are correlated with uh, unusual values of battery drain. Uh, and it actually gives them to you in a sorted order. So you see the most anomalous one first. So for example, here we see, you know, we, maybe you couldn't see it from that table, but we see that uh, application version 50 on this particular hardware of a phone uh, has unusually high battery drain. And you can see the distribution of battery drain for this application versus for uh, all the other phones. And uh, this is incredibly useful, of course, for diagnosing these problems. Uh, and under the hood, there's a machine learning model that does this. Macrobase automatically tunes it for your data, and it also knows how to run it efficiently in a streaming fashion. So you don't need to do that yourself. Uh, now, this uh, project uh, has been going for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, and we've already had a ton of success with early users. So examples of early users are companies in manufacturing, automotive, uh, online video delivery, uh, mobile applications, and uh, internet services. And with all these users, invariably, when they connect Macrobase to their data, you know, connecting it is usually the hardest step. Uh, after that, they, they run it, and they find some interesting groups. For example, uh, car manufacturing manufacturer ran it on some data and found out that a firmware update they hold out to their car uh, was, was actually causing uh, you know, some, something to go wrong and as they were holding out the upgrade. And they immediately noticed this and were able to fix it. So it really empowers people to look at data. And it's this kind of system like search that I think kind of any computer user can use without knowing machine learning. Uh, the project is open source, like all our work in Don, and you can find it online um, on its website. Now that's an example of one end-to-end -end system that we think shows how, how powerful these things can be. I also want to talk briefly about two examples of uh, other things we're doing, which are more components you can use in any system at different layers of the stack. So the first one is changing how you feed data into machine learning. It's a system called Snorkel from Chris Ray's group. 
Um, the idea here, the, the motivation is pretty simple. Uh, basically, training data is the key enabler of all machine learning applications. And the best models you hear about today, the deep learning models and so on, only work uh, by having very large amounts of input data. In fact, the, the larger, more sophisticated your model is, the more input data you need to actually uh, train it. So our joke is sort of that if data is the new oil, then training data, which is data with accurate labels that you can actually use for learning, is the new, new oil. Because this is what really matters. Just a pile of unlabeled data isn't, uh, isn't that useful. Uh, now, in a lot of the AI applications you see today, like, say, image search on the web, it's pretty easy to label data. If you want to find cats and dogs and pandas, you know, uh, first of all, you can just do a search and find lots of images with that text next to them. Second, you can pay people, you know, just a few cents per hour, or, or maybe even for free, they'll sit there and click and label these things for you. So anyone can do it. But what if you have a domain, like, say, a business domain, where uh, data is actually very expensive to label at scale? For example, what if the data is medical images, or maybe it's traces from you know, that machine in your factory that needs to be up running 24-7 or something like that? Well, you can't find lots of labeled medical images on the web. You can't pay people five cents an hour to, to click uh, on them and label them either. So it's way more expensive to acquire training data. And often, this is the biggest expense in actually building uh, these ML applications or even attempting to use ML in these domains. So snorkel is a system that changes the way we interact with data to make uh, labeling much more scalable. And it uses this concept called labeling functions. So basically, instead of a human looking at each item and, and manually saying, you know, a zero or one, is this, a, a, you know, is this a, an error or not? Is this a, a, a disease or not? Uh, users write short programs that uh, can guess at the label of a piece of data. For example, if you're searching for text, or you want to read, say, something like medical articles, uh, you can just search for a simple pattern in the text, like does it contain a sentence of this form? And these labeling functions uh, just need to be right more than chance. They can be wrong a bunch of the time. But the nice thing about them is because they're a program, you can run them on a large amount of data that would otherwise be unable. And, and Snorkel learns both the noise in these functions and a noise-aware model that you're trying to train over it. Um, so the end result of this is that uh, just, just by writing a few labeling functions, like I think 30 or 40 labeling functions in, uh, in, in this example here, and then running them on millions of data points that would otherwise be unlabeled, you get models that are as good as hand labeling of thousands of data points. Uh, this particular example is from a group in the medical school here that tries to read medical articles automatically and figure out uh, interactions between drugs. And basically, some student, some poor student, took two years to hand label these documents before and you know, got a model of a certain quality. Uh, then they sat down for four hours and they told the snorkel team what patterns they look for in those sentences. They ran this on uh, kind of millions of documents and they got the same quality model. Uh, so it's a very powerful way to, uh, to, to work with, uh, uh, with data in these domains. And then the final thing I want to talk about is for the serving or inference side. So you've built a great model, but can you actually apply it at scale and in real time? And the project here that uh, I'm uh, running with Peter Bayliss is called NoScope. Uh, it's about making uh, inference using uh, convolutional neural networks uh, significantly faster. So basically, if you're working with visual data, in this case, we're looking at video, CNNs are an amazing advance in computer vision. Uh, they let you run more accurate queries than ever as possible using previous models. So really great for accurate object detection. Unfortunately, just applying these the best models for CNNs, if you naively just apply them on each frame of video, it's extremely slow. The fastest uh, models that you know, the computer vision community says are real time can process one video stream in real time on one GPU, on a high-end GPU. So basically, you've got you know, one or two dollar camera looking at the stream, and then you've got a thousand dollar GPU behind it. And it's not going to scale to something like a city or you know, maybe even a small building. Um, in no scope, we're able to, to get uh, between 100 and several thousand times speed up over this uh, kind of naive approach uh, with uh, minimal loss in accuracy through two techniques, so model specialization and adaptive cascade. So basically, given your query and your video stream, um, we, we, we take the big model that you want to apply, and we learn a much smaller model uh, that can detect, uh, that can handle the easy cases, basically, and detect those objects in the stream. And when the small 
small model is not sure, we call into the big one, uh, and we can still get overall very high accuracy, but this much faster speed. Um, and just as examples of the results, we ran this on a bunch of videos. This is just showing uh, kind of the worst and the best. Um, so uh, if, if, you, if you want essentially the same accuracy, 99.9%, .9%, you can get about a 40 times speed up. And if you're willing to go down slightly in accuracy, which is actually fine for applications where say you're just counting stuff, like how many people walk by or something, uh, you can go from hundreds to thousands of times faster. So these are just some examples of, of tools and of the ideas we're looking at. Uh, there's quite a bit more happening in the project and the high level idea is to uh, make uh, machine learning available for everyone via new systems that tackle these barriers to real world use that are where most of the effort goes in practice. And you can find out more on our website. Thanks. Questions and comments for Matei? Come up and use one of the two microphones, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I've, I've actually working with uh, some researchers uh, with Snorkel uh, uh -huh. on the, the medical school side. Uh, one question I have is that you know I've I've been to in the previous presentations that I've used. Um, you know, machine learning, like from like the medical side, and mm -hmm. you know, some the, the, I just feel like the you know the one kind of caveat I would say is that sometimes people use these tools as black boxes, not really understanding how they mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. understanding like the issues like you know, cross validation and, and those kind yeah. of issues, and they come up with conclusions that I, I feel like are sometimes you know like potentially erroneous because they mm -hmm. don't really understand. So I think that you know I think dem you know dem having the dem yeah. democratization of AI is important, but. I feel like also there has to be this caveat that people also still have to understand some of the underlying mechanics to be able to do it properly. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And it's um, uh, basically, it, I think it's, it's only really possible to handle that in the truly end-to-end -end systems, like the, the macro-based one I showed that just shows you, hey, here's what these groups look like. Uh, you know, kind of deal with it. You, 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 we just show you the data. But yeah, for the other ones, people will have to understand a little bit about concepts like overfitting or like, oh, my input data isn't, doesn't at all resemble my, uh, you know, my real world test data. So I can't expect it to, to generalize over that. Uh, but that is a good point. The, the one other thing we want to look at here is basically model diagnosis uh, techniques where we can tell you things like, hey, these data items look different or even your predictions look different for this group of, uh, of items. One more question here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you gave an example of solar as a motivating example from mm -hmm. search. But if you look at the site search or internet search in general, it hasn't been a roaring success. And uh, in terms of the quality, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. enable search within course. Sure. But yeah. saying this as a poster child of you mm -hmm. know, highly tuned search output is, of course, not true as of today. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is that in those cases, how much tuning is necessary to get to a reasonable quality, I think is a open mm -hmm. to debate. So yeah. that mm -hmm. repairs me to the related question. So you gave me some examples of the, you know, building blocks. Mm -hmm. Do you have an architecture that you are really, you know, working hard because or it could degenerate into many isolated tools that at the end, uh, as a builder, I don't know what are the APIs I should rely on, what input I must give. Do you have yeah. an integrated picture? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so so we have a, a little bit of both. So we have some of these end-to-end uh, -end systems where we want to build a system for a specific task that uh, that can do that task. But usually that's just a subset of what you do with machine learning, like anomaly detection. Or another one we're working on is recommendation engines. Again, the input to that is really simple. It's just this user yes. you know, bought this item. The output is also simple. It's right. what should you recommend to them. So we want to see if we can automate the stuff in between. Uh, the other pieces we have are just these components. And um, there are different ways to hook them up. Usually, we've been building them so you can hook them up in existing machine learning uh, tooling, like say scikit-learn or uh, you know, different, different kind of APIs for machine learning. But yeah, I would say we, we don't have one specific architecture that we recommend for these generic applications. Uh, they're also kind of for different levels of users. Like something like Snorkel, you still probably need some kind of data scientist after to think about the, the model and so on. But some of the other systems, maybe you don't. Thank yeah. you. Please join me in thanking Matei. <laughs>